Hi, hello again. Uh, I am recording, I think, the fourth video in the educational series uh, My Investment Experience, My Teaching and My Science. And as a matter of fact, this one is like a really complex and compound piece of content. I chose to place it in this specific series uh, so in the accounts of my investment decisions with a little bit of educational and scientific commentary, yet this specific case sort of cuts through many different fields uh, of social sciences, many different fields of economics and management. So I guess that I will be using this case study, the Copernic case study, in a moment I will explain what does it mean Copernic. Uh, I will use it uh, with many different groups of students. I just find it interesting. Okay, so I explain. Let's go to the PowerPoint presentations. I, well, one presentation which I prepared for this a specific case study. It is entitled the Copernic Tokens and Solar Farms. And let's waltz. I explain. So a few weeks ago I reacted to an, a piece of advertising on Facebook. It was a limited liability partnership called the Copernic, Copernic LLP which is a small Polish company. Well, I hope they will not get offended if they get to know that I call them small. But in my personal scale, given the size of businesses I study, they are small, okay? Uh, so that uh, company, uh, Kopernik LLP, based in Kraków, Poland, so in my hometown, they were advertising their financial scheme uh, for financing power installations in the field of renewable energies. And the financial scheme is, is based on digital tokens, like in cryptocurrency style. Uh, why this, uh, let's say, why this combination of renewable energies and cryptocurrencies. Simply because, as, as you will see in a moment, in the short business story that I give, uh, Copernic Limited Liability Partnership is wholly owned by another limited liability partnership, Sapiency LLP, and the latter is precisely active in digital tokenization of smart contracts. So they essentially make blockchain-based tokens for any customer who asks that blockchain technology is the basis of a whole range of membership-based services uh, in digital marketing. So that's uh, essentially, I reacted to that advertising. I gave my email address. I was contacted by those people and I started to think to, I started to consider uh, to invest part of my capital in those digital tokens uh, connected to uh, power installations in renewable energies, more specifically to solar farms. I will explain later on what this connection exactly consists in. My decision, as for now, it is August the 30th, 2020, my decision is rather negative. I would like to do business with those people at Copernic LLP. I had the pleasure and honor to meet them and, uh, and, and I like them. I appreciate their enthusiasm. I appreciate their drive. Yet this specific scheme, which I am going to present in detail through this presentation, it is still, in my op opinion, it is still like half finished. It is not really a fully blown, complete financial scheme for really financing 
a, a reliable project in the field of renewable energies. Anyway, I started with a little background check. Uh, in Poland, we have a publicly available register of incorporated entities. Here on the screen, you can see the link to that thing. Uh, that register is held and run by the Ministry of Justice of the Republic of Poland. And I checked. I did like a little bit of an investigation about Copernic Limited Liability Partnership. Okay, so there is an interesting business story that emerges and that is sort of representative or informative about the way that startup businesses start, how they emerge. So, from that register at the Ministry of Justice, I learned that uh, Copernic LLP is a relatively young business. They were founded uh, in December last year, in December 2019. Uh, in the beginning, they were founded in Gdańsk, Poland. So it is like, uh, to give you an idea, for those of you who don't know at all the geography of Poland, the place where I live and, and the place where Kopernik LLP has its headquarters now, so Kraków is in the very south of Poland and Gdańsk is in the very north of Poland. It is like 400 miles of distance, one from the other. So, initially in December 2019, uh, Copernic Limited Liability Partnership was founded technically by two partners. One physical person and one other limited liability partnership, TTC Trade. I checked that last one and I discovered that this specific partnership, TTC Trade, was wholly owned by the same physical person who stepped like next to it as a partner in Copernic. It is a strange construct, I don't know why they did it. Anyway, uh, here we come to the size of the business. So that physical person apported 1000 uh, Polish Zlotys in exchange of one partner share and her own limited liability partnership, that TTC Trade, paid in 4000 Polish Zlotys in exchange of four partner shares. To give an idea of what kind of money we are talking about, for those of you who are not Polish and don't really know the exchange rate of the Polish Zloty, here I give a rough, a rough idea. At the moment when I was writing this presentation, one Polish Zloty was worth 27 US cents. Okay. So the second part or the second volume of the business story unfolds uh, in the beginning of May this year, in the beginning of May 2020. So the physical person who founded uh, Copernic LLP steps out of, uh, of, of the partnership and uh, her own LLP, that TC, TTC trade things, sells two of its partner shares to a company based in Kraków, Sapiency LLP. Uh, and it is two partner shares against 2000 Polish Zlotys. On the same day, the whole partnership agreement is renegotiated and signed a, a, a new and according to what was written to what is written in the in that register uh, of the ministry of justice it was entirely renegotiated and entirely rephrased and by the same occasion two other facts happen the headquarters of Copernic LLP are moved from Gdańsk to Kraków and a 
third business entity, Reset Sun Energy LLP. You can see their name here. Huh? Yeah. They step into the game, apparently just for a short time you will see it, and take two partner shares in Copernic LLP for 2000 Zlotys and all those operations which took place on the 6th of May pumped up the partner equity of Copernic from 5000 Zloty to 6000 Zloty. And finally, on July the 20th this year, TTC Trade and Reset Sun Energy, those two partner limited liability partnerships, both sell their partnerships to, uh, excuse me, they sell their partner shares to Sapiency LLP at their face value. So at the end of the day, or on July the 20th, we land with that business structure when one limited liability partnership, Copernic, is wholly owned by another limited liability partnership, Sapiency. And Sapiency, as I checked them, in turn is owned in 50-50 proportions by two gentlemen who look as if they were family. I had uh, the pleasure and the honor to meet one of them, who is the CEO of Copernic. I like the guy. He is like fire and ice in one. I like such personalities. And this is why I would like to keep doing business with them, but we'll see. Anyway, now I pass to generalities, because in order to understand that scheme, that financial scheme in this case, it is important to understand the idea of smart contracts. So here I give a few slides about uh, about smart contracts. Uh, so smart contracts are based on both a legal concept and a digital concept or a digital technology. From the legal point of view, there are, let's say, two legal schools as regards contracts. There is what we would call the European Roman German school, which considers each contract as a complex, essentially indivisible entity. So each contract is like a monad. Uh, it is a complex entity which we cannot really split into parts. A contract is like a clock mechanism with those cogwheels strictly dependent one on the other. Now uh, there is another stream which according to what I read in legal literature started essentially, I think, with, uh, with the Jewish law, with the Torah. And it is the idea that if we have a contract, we can sort of take parts of that contract and uh, single them out from that complex structure and consider them a little bit like abstract, independent, uh, legal concepts or abstract independent legal entities. Uh, I believe that in legal sciences that operation of singling out parts of a contract is called partition and abstraction. So it is sometimes possible to split a complex contractual agreement into component building blocks and then use those blocks like Lego construction blocks. And as a matter of fact, there are many contracts which are like that. For example, when we sign a typical loan agreement with the bank, that agreement de facto is a composition of those Lego legal building blocks. There is a building block about the parties to the contract. There is a building block about uh, the interest rate, there is a building block about the capital being lent and borrowed, there is a building block about the schedule of 
payment installments and so on. Huh? So uh, that legal concept of partitioning and abstracting parts of a complex contractual scheme is not entirely new. Yet what happened with the advent of the blockchain technology is the possibility of making it happen in a very flexible in a very flexi uh, uh, in a very flexible uh, digital structure. So here on that slide you can see uh, the beginning, the title and the abstract of a paper published by Satoshi Nakamoto. And just for your information, people keep arguing until today if Satoshi Nakamoto was a real person or was it maybe a nickname for a whole team of professional hackers. Anyway, Satoshi Nakamoto published a paper entitled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. This is, in this paper, you can find the, the foundational concepts of what cryptocurrencies are today. Anyway, the, the system of the peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system of what we, or what we know today as blockchain technology, allows making very flexible uh, smart contracts. So it allows making a contract into something like a technology which changes constantly. And blockchain, uh, mostly to my knowledge, the Ethereum platform allows to create uh, very quickly smart contracts. You can try by yourself, by the way. Okay. okay, maybe I will enlarge myself. It's not megalomany, I just want to be visible for my viewers. Okay. So now I pass to the basic concept of the Copernic project. Uh, I assume that after those two slides devoted to smart contracts, you essentially understand the basic scheme. Uh, or the basic philosophy, now I pass to the specific context of this project. So the idea is that Copernic LLP builds solar farms, then they create lease agreements as for those farms, and they transform those complex lease agreements into smart contracts, so into, co into digital contracts made of those Lego building blocks. And here comes the first series of tokens that Copernic is essentially marketing already now. They are called the Copernic One tokens. And according to what they claim and what they state in their official papers, each Copernic One token, which I can buy today for the face value of four Zlotis uh, per one token. Four Zlotis is a little bit more than one US dollar. Each such Copernic One token constitutes like a small share in a big lease agreement of those solar farms. I know it sounds a little bit foggy, and honestly, I have the same impression. I discuss it more in detail further on in this same presentation when I will be talking about risk factors, which I identified in the whole thing. So that's the first step. There are those Copernic One tokens, which represent small participations in a big lease agreement in those solar farms built by Copernic. And essentially the sales of those Copernic One tokens, it is important, they are supposed to finance the construction of those solar farms. So the, those Copernic One tokens are really like uh, 
like a component on the passive side of the balance sheet. Now, the second component of this uh, Copernic project is the tokenization or the transformation into digital tokens of the future output of electricity from those same solar farms. So, Copernic One tokens are marketed to finance the construction of solar farms. The solar farms are being built, become operational, and once they are fully operational and once they start generating electricity, Copernic LLP starts creating and marketing uh, a second series of digital tokens, which are called Copernic KWH. Of course, KWH corresponds to kilowatt hour. Okay. And then the scheme is the following. Those who are the holders of the Copernic One tokens, so those primary investors, let's say, are being attributed, are being given those Copernic KWH tokens and the general scheme, as I read it in their papers, that not less frequently than once a week, each Copernic One token like gets one Copernic KW, KWH token. So each Copernic One token every week acquires at least one kilowatt hour worth of electricity from those solar farms when they are already operational. And like the final, uh, the, f the final link in the chain is the an, an, an electronic platform called the Kanga Exchange. Uh, in the window of the video, you have the, the link to, to, to their website. And that Kanga Exchange is essentially an exchange of cryptocurrencies. Besides those Copernic tokens, you can trade their like Bitcoins, Ethereums and others. And uh, those secondary tokens and, uh, or let's say both the primary tokens, Copernic One, and the secondary tokens, Copernic KWH, are supposed to be traded and exchanged at that Kanga Exchange platform. That's the, like the end of the whole chain. Now, I calculated, and this is like the optimistic end or optimistic aspect of the whole scheme. I tried to calculate the, let's say, the basic, the baseline return that I can have on one Copernic One token. As I said, today I can buy one Copernic One token for, for a face value of four Polish Zlotys. In the same time, I checked the average price of electricity in Poland, all components included, per one kilowatt hour, and it is around uh, 0 0.617 Polish zloty, so like, uh, uh, like 62 of Polish grosz. Grosz is one hundredth of a zloty in the Polish monetary system. So I calculated that one Copernic one token corresponds at the prices that both have today roughly 6.2 kilowatt hours of energy. And assuming that starting from the day zero of operationality in that, uh, in that solar farm, um, after seven weeks, uh, assuming that every week, or at, at least once a week, I will receive one Copernic KWH token for each Copernic One token I hold, it turns out that that Copernic One token allows me to break even in terms of electricity value 
not later than after seven weeks. So that looks cool, okay? Uh, and now I studied the risk factors. Uh, it is like a common thing in all business plans and I consider this investment decision as like a small business plan and this is one I give this account. So the first risk factor is a very unclear institutional status of the exchange platform, of the Kanga exchange platform. According to what they explicitly phrase out at their website, here I give specifically the link just to be 100% sure. So they claim that Kanga Exchange is operated by Good Investments Limited, registered in accordance with the International Business Companies Act of the Republic of Seychelles, company number 192185. Now, Seychelles, I will be brutal here, but Seychelles are or is a shell jurisdiction. It means that it is a place where you incorporate a company when you don't want to be watched by too many government agencies. Uh, there is, I couldn't find any kind of legal register of companies incorporated in the Republic of Seychelles, so I have no clue what kind of information can be found under that company number. But I checked that if I really want, I can incorporate a new business in the Seychelles from my desk, like 100% online, and I even found a price tag. For 399 British pounds, I can incorporate a fully blown business in the Seychelles. So if my point is that if the digital exchange, which essentially gives the final real market value to those tokens, both the Copernic One tokens and the Copernic KWH tokens, if this platform is operated by a company incorporated in a shell jurisdiction, it looks sketchy. I know that uh, cryptocurrencies are sort of a fringe business in most U European legal systems and sometimes it is hard to convince a government that doing cryptocurrencies and doing digital tokens you are not performing any criminal activity. Yet Seychelles I mean, really, it, it doesn't really inspire trust in that Kanga exchange business. The second risk factor is uh, the very weak uh, equity of Copernic LLP. So their partner equity, such as it is uh, reported in that official register of the Ministry of Justice, so their partner equity is six. 6,000 PLN. So it is like a little bit more than 1,600 US dollars. According to the official papers that they present at their website, the first solar farm they intend to build is supposed to have a nominal power of one megawatt. I did some maths and I did some research. I found an interesting report. I will magnify it and show it here in the center of the screen. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, the report is called Renewable Power Generation Costs. Uh, in 2019, it, is being, it, it has been published uh, in June this year by that international body IRENA.org. IRENA stands for International Renewable Energy Agency. They are located in the Arab Emirates and they are sort of solid and cool as for their publications. Uh, okay, so I checked. Let me... I checked uh, that report and it turned out that if we include the necessary investment to acquire the piece of land 
world that solar farm is supposed to be built. A cautious estimation of the over, or over, overall capital outlay required for a one megawatt solar farm, it would be around two million zlotys. So like half a million US dollars. 540,000 uh, US dollars to be specific, according to the present exchange rates. So on the one hand, we have a company with a partner equity of barely more than, than $1,600. And on the other hand, we have a project, allegedly just the first in a series, a project uh, requiring around half a million dollars of investment. And my question is, what the hell? Are those tokens, those Copernic One tokens, supposed to finance the entire thing? It doesn't really look like reliable financially. And here is the thing. Uh, I worked a lot in my own business planning uh, with a utility called uh, an online functionality called Project Navigator and the Project Navigator is operated precisely by the same body, by IRENA, by the International Renewable Energy Agency. And my conclusions from those simulations which are possible with that on, on online tool is that you need really a good financial and legal basis for those renewable installations. If the institutional base is somehow wobbly or sketchy, it always bites you in the ass at the end of the day. Hmm? So here with that huge financial gap between the money that Copernic has and the money that Copernic wants to collect for those solar farms, here I have some doubts. The third risk factor is precisely that unclear uh, concept of leasing those farms. You can check it more specifically online. Essentially, you know that if you want to use physically a piece of real estate, you have two contractual schemes to choose between. You can rent it or you can lease it. When you rent a piece of real estate, it is assumed that you use it just for the satisfaction for your, of your personal needs. But when you lease a piece of real estate, it is assumed that you exploit that real estate in order to derive economic benefits, economic profit from that exploitation. Here in this case, we talk about leasing those solar farms. And about that leasing, that, talk, uh, that uh, Copernic project allegedly relies on, there are two things which I don't quite understand. First of all, a lease is not really divisible into parts. You remember that, as I presented it earlier, according to the Copernic philosophy, the, like an overall overarching lease of the whole solar farm, is supposed to be split into those small participatory tokens, the Copernic One tokens. Only, as I said, a lease is not really divisible. If you want to divide legally a lease agreement, you need to divide the, the object of the lease. So you need to divide the real estate that you are leasing. So you essentially you split it into a, a multitude of small pieces. And I didn't really find any explanation in the official papers of Copernic LLP how do they see it, how this specific contractual turn is supposed to be taken. And uh, there is an, another thing purely logical. If I assume that I will be leasing a small fraction of a solar part from Copernic, who will be the owner of the solar farm, then logically I should pay to Copernic a rent for leasing that solar farm. 
but actually they will be paying me in those electricity based the Copernic KWH tokens they will be paying me so it is as if I was the owner of the farm and and as if they were leasing uh, that farm from me uh, this is really unclear I don't quite grasp that contractual scheme and before investing in those tokens I would really like to see it like uh, black on white uh, explicitly written in a contract and finally uh, the fourth risk factor I noticed in this project is that the system of initial financing with tokens can jeopardize economic payoff from the project. Because the philosophy here is the following. The solar farm makes power, it makes electricity. That electricity gets like paired with those digital tokens, uh, Copernic KWH. And those tokens get attributed to the holders of the primary tokens, the Copernic One tokens. So if the system works as expected, so if, if, if the holders of Copernic One tokens get like a satisfactory uh, reward in Copernic KWH tokens, there is very little electricity or no electricity at all left for sale right so essentially that solar farm besides paying back to the initial founders apparently will not be doing any op operational business they will not have any important revenue from selling electricity for money strictly speaking and here i summarize it in those bullet points as long as we want that solar farm to work, it needs to generate a positive operational cash flow. Yes, there is no way around it. So photovoltaic equipment can bring you a stream of amortization because it ages both physically and morally. Yet, if you want to consider amortization as an, a positive operational cash flow, you need some kind of stream of revenue to write that amortization off from. If you have no revenue, you have nothing to write that amortization off from. So amortization is not positive operational cash flow anymore. So if all or a substantial part of energy produced in the solar farm is tokenized and attributed to the holders of Copernic One, least based tokens, there could be hardly any energy left for sale, hence not much of a revenue. So the whole system of financing with those tokens, whilst it looks uh, attractive at the first sight, it has weaknesses. By the way, I have been working like for two years on something very similar. I labeled it NFIN. I wrote about it on my blog many times. And I came to the same conclusion that once we put the token system in the game, it is very interesting, but at the end of the day, it proves dysfunctional. And finally, there is a question uh, which I was asked uh, by one or indirectly asked, let's say, by one of the people whom I met at Copernic. So let's phrase it as uh, in the following way. Isn't it ethically advisable to invest in renewable energies, even if the legal scheme is a bit sketchy? And we, uh, shouldn't we invest just to push forward the development of those renewables? And here I have two answers. For, first of all, according to the available statistics, on which I can develop in another video, the industry of renewables, of renewable sources of an energy is growing like hell. There are places on earth when this industry is literally booming and exploding, exploding in the positive sense of the term, of course. 
So from the strictly quantitative point of view, that industry doesn't really look as if they needed like an extra push. And secondly, I return to the same thing which I already signaled in connection with the risk factors. If we start a project in the field of renewable energies with a wobbly, sketchy, unstable legal and financial base, so if we ground that project in um, sketchy contracts and in an unstable capital base, this is the worst service we can give to the industry of renewables because such a project will inevitably fall into pieces. It will inevitably collapse both in technological and in financial terms and it will just leave a lot of bad smell uh, af after the collapse and it can just tarnish the reputation of the whole industry. Okay, so that would be all. In this video, you could see like in real time and in real life, what does it take to consider a business opportunity. So I, cons I want to use this video as teaching material for both my students of economics and my students of management and my students of more advanced specialized courses, just to show how practical business decisions are being taken. So, as usually, have fun with life and have fun with science. Bye.